Guys, last year, I will say, on Christmas Eve, you looked at the team and you thought, okay, this is just a Matt Patricia, Joe Judge problem. If you can just get Mac Jones, an offensive guy, I can't laugh, not laugh at myself, an <laughs> offensive coordinator who works. This time, next year on Christmas Eve, we're going to be talking about a bit different Patriots team. That's at least what I thought. Did you guys think that one year, Phil, we would be in a worse position? And by we, I mean the Patriots would be in a worse position than they were last year at this time. I never assumed that would be the case because I assumed after last season and as bad as it was that they would have gone into the next offseason to really go hard at finding solutions to the problems. And I think they did. Robert Kraft essentially making it clear you're going to have a real offensive coordinator next year. And they got one. And I certainly didn't think that they would be where they are today this past off season. So Christmas Eve, you know, that's a, there's a lot of time between mm -hmm. last Christmas Eve and this one. But, Bert, if you ask me July 24th of 2023, if this is where they would be, I would have said no shot. Yeah, I think you look like feel a little bit more ridiculous looking straight at the camera at yourself <laughs> and like this, this sort of thing. But you're going to um, power through it. I, I, I would absolutely agree with both you guys and that like I I think like even like the signs at the beginning of the offseason right like when we got the statement from Robert Kraft and when we got the full on offensive coordinator search and when Gerard Mayo was inserted into the offensive coordinator search and you wind up with Bill O'Brien who has experience as an NFL play caller in two different places you know you figure okay like this is the start of a very serious offseason and then they didn't address the tackle problem and then they nickel and dime the receiver issue. And then you look at it, it's like, I, I think we were all kind of under the assumption where it was like the way that last year went at quarterback was going to be the harbinger for an overall change on offense and a change in philosophy and how they put the offense together. And we got that first piece of it when they hired O'Brien, but then the rest of it was never there. And, you know, now you've pissed away what was – that advantage that you had of a quarterback on a rookie contract. And we've seen teams use that advantage to get to Super Bowls over the last five years habitually. And it's just, it's just disappointing because it feels like there's so much they could have done. And I don't even know that we have like a full answer on who Mac Jones is going to be as a quarterback. Like, I don't think anybody's sitting here saying he's a franchise quarterback, but I don't think anybody can say either that we have a full read on what he is as an NFL player. Uh, will we get coal in our stocking next year again with the Patriots? Like when you think about it, you said if you would have asked me on December 24th or July 24th, I wouldn't have predicted this. You look ahead. What what do you think we'll see? How should it look this time next year? Well, if, if coal means are they going to be a three or four win team by late December next year? The answer to that, unfortunately for them, is maybe. Yeah. But at least they uh, will be. That was be... not what I was expecting you to say, Phil. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, they, they have a path right now, though, Trenny, where you're looking at maybe having a rookie quarterback and a complete rebuild, especially on the offensive side of the ball. We saw the Bengals do this a few years ago. They nailed the quarterback pick when they had the first overall selection and they took Joe Burrow. They still only won four games that year, and Burrow ended up hurt. So just because you get that pick and just because you have almost $100 million in cap space, doesn't mean that they're going to have everything solved or that they're even going to yeah. be all that much improved by this time next year. I mean, the Bengals are a good example because you had an idea that they got it right on Burrow and T Higgins was on the roster and you started to see some pieces on defense that they had gone and gotten in free agency and guys like Sam Hubbard were coming along and it's like, okay, there's a foundation here. And then they draft Jamar Chase fifth overall. Like, I, I think that that's what you've got to look for next year. It's not where they are in September or October. Because, again, if they, they may have a rookie quarterback. They may have a first-time head coach. They may have a reworked coaching staff. Like, so there's going to be a lot of new things here. And so if we're sitting there in September and October and litigating who they are on a week-to-week -week basis, we're being morons about it. Because next year is probably going to be a full reset. What you're going to be looking for next year is – when you get to November, when you get to Thanksgiving, when you get to Christmas, that it's an ascending group where you can look at it and say, in 2025, it looks like this team's going places. Both of you point to the Bengals as a good example of if the Patriots play their cards right, get the right quarterback and move forward, the Bengals is a blueprint that maybe they could follow. Mm -hmm. On the opposite side of the spectrum, I would say, is the team they're going to play this weekend in the Broncos. The Broncos have not had much success as of late, just like the Patriots. The last time Denver made the playoffs, I couldn't believe this when I looked at pro football reference today 
2015 with that 24-10 win over the Panthers in Super Bowl 50, which sent Peyton Manning into retirement with the Lombardi Trophy. Phil, I, you know, when I look at this game this weekend, and sometimes I feel like this too, and I know Miami's having a successful season right now, but it just took so long. John Elway. You look at um, Dan Marino down in Miami. Like, what happens if you are a franchise, the New York Giants, the New York Jets, all these teams that cannot find a quarterback? To me, the Broncos are an example of a very proud franchise with someone like John Elway in charge who mm -hmm. has too much power and people listen to him almost too much. And then you find yourself in a position where you're not successful anymore. And I guess that's why not to compare Bill Belichick to John Elway, but both were very successful in what they did in the time that they did it. But neither to me has been able to really adapt to this new NFL and it put their franchises in a tough spot. Yeah, and I, I just look at the Broncos between then, that last playoff appearance, and now, and, and how many opportunities did they even have at getting the franchise level quarterback? And they thought they had one in Russell Wilson, and he's playing much better this year. I'll grant him that, but I don't know how much longer he's going to be in Denver, even with all the money they've given him. I'm not sure he is that franchise guy. And so that, to me, is the key. If you're the Patriots, Bert, and you're looking ahead, and you have an opportunity, maybe with the first or second overall pick, and you have the shot to roll the yeah. dice on the face of your franchise, you have to take it because the Broncos, and there have been other teams, they are in yeah. some ways not – always well positioned and it, sometimes well, it takes decades the Broncos are to the, get that next guy. I've heard a lot of people say, well, draft Marvin Harrison and then come up at the bottom of the first round and get your quarterback that way or draft Olu Fashano or, or John Alt and then come up at the bottom of the first round and get your quarterback that way. The Broncos to me are a cautionary tale on when you try to nickel and dime the quarterback position or you don't go all in. The odds are longer. It doesn't mean it can't work, but if you look at it, right, like so Brock Osweiler, second-round pick, Drew Locke, second-round pick, Paxton Lynch, that's a end of the first-round pick, right? Those three guys were all, what, top 50 picks, right? So they spent three top 50 picks on quarterbacks in a five-year span, and that's the biggest reason why they were in the position they were in and why they had to go out and they had to overspend to get Russell Wilson. And then that doesn't work out either. So, like, I think it does – what happened with the Broncos does highlight, I think, where it's not a perfect science taking a quarterback first overall, second overall, third overall, but you got a better shot doing it that way than you have doing it the other way. We at least think that the Patriots um, are probably going to have to choose not just a quarterback, but also a new head coach. In terms of success, and this might be a what comes first, the chicken or the egg, What's more important, picking the right quarterback or picking the right coach? Because we have also seen, if you don't pick the right coach, and I think of, of the Chargers in this, then you waste a good quarterback. There's no doubt. Although I would also say if you don't get the quarterback right, then there's almost no chance for the head coach hmm. to have success. I mean, what great head coach is out there that has had nothing at quarterback? I mean, you have to go back to somebody like uh, maybe Joe, Joe Gibbs. Gibbs, right, who won a Super Bowl with three different starting quarterbacks. So uh, that to me is, is – and you're right. I think it is a chicken or the egg sort of question. To me, I think you have to get the head coach right just so that – you at least, while you're on this path, a path that is probably going to be bumpy regardless of who you have at quarterback for 2024, at least you're going in the right direction. At least people around the organization from top to bottom are bought in, depending on that coach's message. If you get it right at the coaching spot, it can make everything a little bit easier to swallow if and when things get tough. And I think, like, we can look to, like, the environment the quarterback goes into is really, really important. Like Lamar Jackson had John Harbaugh. Patrick Mahomes had Andy Reid. That's not saying those guys wouldn't have made it otherwise, but it certainly helps. You know, if you have a guy who knows what he's doing as your head coach, it puts the quarterback in a better position to succeed. And I also think in a lot of, a lot of times, like the, the coach – Identify the, who, who, the guy who's identifying the quarterback is important, too. Like Kyle Shanahan's a good example in San Francisco. We talk about a guy who didn't spend high-end first-round capital to find his guy. Well, he did at one point. Tried. Right? He tried. Right. But, like, he was good enough at identifying quarterbacks to trade for Jimmy Garoppolo and get, like, a three- or four-year answer there for a second-round pick and then get Brock Purdy at the end of the draft. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to be – it doesn't mean you're, you're counting on, like, a seventh-round pick to become your starting quarterback – but if you have a guy who knows who I, how to identify quarterbacks, it certainly does help.